Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to leg five of the podcast relay. Uh, really looking forward to this afternoon's conversation. I am joined here by Casper Berry. Casper, thank you very much for joining us. I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction while everyone is able to come in and join um, as we've just gone live. Um, so we are in leg five. So we kicked off with Catherine Granger, who passed to Claire Balding, who made a very swift handover to Krista Cullen, followed by Kelly Brown, who has made the handover to Casper Berry. So we are having a very varied opportunity to explore the question that if I knew then what I know now, so what? What difference would we make? And, I, and I'm really, really looking forward to the opportunity to have the conversation with you this afternoon, Casper, about this as well. Um, I guess by way of kicking things off, Casper, a couple of things. It'd be great to know through your words how you describe yourself. So there's various um, descriptions out there of you, but I think it's, it's always most important to hear how the guests describe themselves and also just, you know, how the last couple of months have been for you and what, what you're in the middle of at the moment and how things are from your perspective before we get into the bulk of the conversation. Great. So I am a former professional poker player is the best way of putting that. It's really important and important to the context of this conversation to understand that although that does form the basis of my work now, which is as a professional speaker and trainer, I did that 20 years ago. So it's a part of me, but it's actually quite a small part of me. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm a professional speaker and trainer. Uh, the arse of which has completely fallen out uh, in the last two months. <laughs> and I'm having a whale of a time, I have to be honest with you. I've wanted a sabbatical for like the last 15 years. The problem when you're a speaking trainer is it's very hard to say no to work because the, the amount that you get paid for each individual job is quite enticing. It's very difficult to go no. You have to phone up all the speaker bureaus and go take me off the books. You don't want to do that because they might never put you back on again. So mm -hmm. the, the upshot of it is, is that it's quite a disciplined thing to do to take a sabbatical unless the world's phones just stop ringing, um, in which case it's really simple. So, uh, so I've had a great time. And actually during the course of this conversation, I'll talk about that a little bit, that I've been enjoying not doing anything you know I haven't gone so I'm uh you know running to Zimbabwe for charity I'm thinking reading uh I've enjoyed the sunshine and yeah. a lot of things that you know maybe are a bit taboo like we just shouldn't stop but I'm finding stopping brilliant yeah and, and certainly a lot of people that we've been talking to over the last few months actually the pausing and the stopping the enforced pause for a lot of people yeah where they're in the position to be able to take advantage of that has, has definitely been a, a, a nice gear shift for them and also a kind of a challenge of existing beliefs, I guess. Yeah, and I think I do want to make that point. I'm very lucky to be able to do that, do you know what I mean? I've, I've put some savings aside and so I can I can take a year off. Now, I think I have to anyway, and I'm getting minimal um, money from the government, so, so it's lucky that I can do that. But I think where and when one can, it's a real gift to take that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and great that you've been in this pause moment as well, I guess, because if we're going to talk about some reflection and the power of ref reflection through if I knew then what I know now, so what? That, you know, hopefully there's been more time than you may have typically had to sort of pull together your answer. So where, where do you want to start with that? You know, if I knew then what I know now, but, 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 so what? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to start by asking you a question, which I didn't prepare you for, but I, did, I think it's an interesting question. Maybe someone else previously has asked it, but I, I'm just curious why why because i think it's a great question why what drew you to that question why do you want to know that from people um because of the power it brings in terms of reflection but the opportunity to see how far you've grown because I, I definitely i definitely never wanted it to be a looking back with melancholy at what might have been but actually that <laughs> 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 Yeah, you can, <laughs> it's, it's really that opportunity to actually reflect back upon some key points, realise the impact of change that's happened, because I then think that allows feeding forward with more confidence that, well, actually, you know, that made a significant change. I did learn that. I do that. I do know that now. Am I making the most of it? Yeah. Am I using that knowledge and, and actually developing the next chapter so I'll be able to reflect again? So it's very much driven by that growth rather than sort of, you know, having the chance to feel bad about previous points in time. Right, which is regret. And, and obviously that's something that I speak about when you talk about risk. You can't help but talk about regret because they're two sides of the same coin in many ways. You take a risk in order to avoid regret. And so one of my observations about that, when I think about my life, right, and you asked me effectively embedded within that question is to go back and to think about my life and mm -hmm. what you do differently if you know what you know now 
is that I've always felt that we have two, we have one word regret, which means two very different things, right? One of them is the way in which you've described it here, which is to sort of flagellate ourselves for not yeah, doing things yeah. different. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I should have known that. But the other perfectly healthy way of using regret, I think, because I don't think there's an alternative word, feel free to suggest one, is like I've learned things during that time. Mm. And if I knew then what I know now, I would have done things differently. So that's completely fine to say, I regret not doing it differently. It would have been better to have done it differently. But that doesn't mean to say that I'm going to beat myself up about it or dwell on it. Um, you know, more that you ruminate on the lesson learned. You might have learned that lesson five times. You know, how many times do we go, oh, I knew I should trust my first instinct or whatever it is, right? But uh, so I think that, that it's, it's one of those occasions where one word, at the paucity of the English language, which doesn't have much paucity, it's an amazing language. <laughs> but, but in this occasion, we, there isn't enough richness, I think, to describe that subtle distinction. Yeah, yeah, there, there, is, there, is, there isn't anything for the sort of, you know, the the addition of valued perspective in one right. word is there right but but saying I, i'm completely comfortable with going i would have done things differently yeah. because because so i'm going to tell you now that uh, you you talk in your notes about going back to a specific age and the specific age in fact i can cite it to a day it's the 17th of june 1991 which is the day that i finished my a levels mm -hmm. um and just to give a bit of perspective i went to a, a good school i think in my year we came ninth in the country by a level results right so you know i'd had a a, a good education i i I, knew, no, I didn't know at that point, but when the results came through, I knew I was going to Cambridge to study economics. Um, so I'm an academic kid. And I just think that, and I felt this at the time, that I was just so unprepared for the world, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and so the starting point for me is that education prepares us very badly for the world. I remember being in Las Vegas, which obviously is key to my life story, but it's not significant. <laughs> sitting in a restaurant in Las Vegas with my mate. And we must have been about 26 at the time. And I remember saying to him, that there seems to be some people in life who were very driven. They were very focused. Now I was driven because I, I knew from the age of 16, I'd been in Biker Grove, kids. I was in the first two series of Biker Grove as an actor. I knew that I wanted to be a film director. I right. thought I wanted to be a film director. So even when I went to Cambridge, I was way more focused than the average person. But I just, I felt that like some people had been given this map of how the world worked, yeah. which I don't think I became exposed to until uh, probably about 2004, I was about 31. And, and actually my exposure to that came through, uh, not everyone's favorite guy, but Tony Robbins, you know, just, yeah. just exposing me to a, a different way of looking at things like goal setting. I went through that whole period of education, you know, without learning about goal setting. So that's the, that's the background to the answer. And then as I've already sort of briefed you, what I want to do is, I want to go through, it's a long list, but I'll go through it really, really quickly, of all the things that education does not teach you at all, right, which it could in the time that you're learning about uh, chlorophyll or whatever it is, okay? Yeah. Things that you'll never think about again. I regularly use Jethro Tull's seed drill in my presentations to make the point that I try and force my entire educational curriculum into my world of work. <laughs> Just so it feels useful. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> that, that using nets to turn a two-dimensional thing into a three-dimensional. So yes, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm really trying to pay back my education. But <laughs> I can't get it all in there. Chlorophyll is a challenge. I try and use calculus on a daily basis. And by the way, calculus is brilliant. I mean, that's not my point. So listen here. So what do we learn during lockdown? Okay, here we go. How, this is what I would like to have learned. Okay, what I learned that I don't know. Yeah. How to cook. I mean, nothing, nothing in my school. And there are some schools that teach home ec and you do cooking and that's great. But all of this is subjective. How to sleep. I remember I did a three hour course at Cambridge at the age of 21 or 20 on how to sleep. And I was mind blown by the fact that I'd been through a whole education system without literally mentioning the word sleep and sleep cycle and REM and all that kind of thing. Yeah. I think it's going quicker. How to uh, clean a house, how to put up shelves, technical stuff generally. I lit I'm 47 years old, I don't know how to change a plug. How to be alone. I heard this on Radio 5 okay. Live recently, this author talking about how to be, everything's about how to socialize and be with people, how to be alone with your own thoughts. Of course, now with all the kids at home, how to be a parent, developmental psychology generally, how to teach some people the Socratic method. Okay, now the other thing I've discussed with you is after being a professional poker player, I knew I wanted to be a speaker. So I joined a company called The Mind Gym, which is a training mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, a, for three years of my life, went into companies, huge companies, the biggest companies on the planet, and gave 90 minute teaching sessions in 
the following and more, right? Why didn't we learn any of this at school? Because it clearly has value because UBS Bank are prepared to pay thousands for their people to learn it. How to communicate clearly, how to have an idea, thinking laterally, the word of, work of Edward de Bono, divergent thinking, critical thinking and evaluation, how to calm and still your mind, how to have a difficult conversation, how to be honest with other people, how to read other people's honesty, the habits and qualities of successful people, how to give feedback, how to manage your boss, how to lead and take responsibility. Seven Habits has sold 25 million copies because yeah. it teaches at least seven things that have enormous value, starting with the end in mind, focusing on what you can control, how to motivate yourself, how to motivate others, how to organize time and prioritize, how to speak in public, oratory generally, what luck is and how to think about it, return on investment, what it is and how to achieve it, your USP as a person in the labor market. Sorry, but it goes on. <laughs> Alan de Botton, do you know him? Alan de Botton yeah. and his work, yeah. Um, and again, you know, people, I know people who, paying a lot of money to learn these kind of life skills and some people might think well that can't be taught but it can and and people want to learn it things as simple as you might think is how to be nice how to make friends how to talk to people at a wedding or a dinner party how, how to chat someone up literally how to interact on social media and how not to how to develop this is a big one for me and we'll talk about this later how to develop self-worth that has nothing to do with other people it doesn't emanate yeah, the yeah. thoughts of others how to keep an internal scorecard, how to disagree, how to debate and win, how to be in touch with your feelings, your sexuality, your sex and gender, how to creatively visualize, how to mend a broken heart, how to manage stress, resilience generally, how to bounce back, nothing, mm. nothing in 14 years of education on that. Focus, how to block out interruptions, how to find your bliss and your thing, how to tell a joke well, how to play a game well, Civics, I understand, are probably touching on this more, but don't worry, we're nearing the end. How to pay taxes, when to pay taxes, how and why we vote, how to interact with your MP, how to evaluate elect um, politicians' promises, how to travel and absorb culture, business skills. I know you can study business now, but not everyone does. It's not compulsory. How to sell, keeping company accounts, bookkeeping. What is entrepreneurialism? How to manage risk? How to make a decision? There is a method for making a decision. It's what I teach. Companies pay me a lot of money. Could have learned it at 15, no reason why you can't. Basics of microeconomics, supply, demand, price, metrics of marketing, how PPC works, social media generally. And so, I don't know how old you are, Chris, I'm 47. And I was the second year to do GCSEs, which was an interesting experience because what it meant was we'd sort of, from the age of 11, we, we were training for one set of exams, which was O-levels, and then it changed. I was, I was the last year to do O-levels. So right, okay. I, I got off lightly. Well, no, I don't think there were pros and cons of both, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. But well, GCSEs were interesting because they quite radically changed the curriculum in a certain direction. Yeah. And I think, if anything, you know, Gove and Cummings reversed a lot of that or certainly tried to and wanted to. But I'll give you an example. So, so history changed from like just dates and things mm -hmm. to how to read documents, right? How to read for bias, how to understand the historical process and the skills of a historian. But that should change again to what you learn from history. Mm -hmm. I mean, I honestly studied history for, you know, as many years as you have to up to GCSE and never ever we just never had a conversation about what you can learn from those what? events. Yeah, yeah. And how, what's, what's recycling? What's happening again? How's that informing some of the things that we're seeing in right. you know, the current day? Right. How to evaluate the news. Just how to critically think about these things that are on the news. That most kids in most schools, or let's say a lot of kids, think is just boring. Because yeah. it's just not being made relevant or interesting to them. Languages became went from like declining a verb to sort of communicating in situ. But here's the thing, why is it in 2020, kids still aren't taught languages like the Michelle Thomas method, which teaches you how to learn a language in the same way that your brain learns a language, how it learns a language when it's, when it's three years old. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't, you don't learn a language. You certainly don't learn a language by declining verbs. And you definitely don't learn a language by um, learning how to write a letter to your pen pal in France. Yeah. You learn a language through the anchoring of certain words to certain meanings and then using those as modules and building blocks. Why, why isn't the meta method of learning generally taught? Well, yeah, and learning how to learn. You know, working with a lot of the athletes over the years, we've yeah. sought competitive advantage by how do we get better at reflecting and evaluating and embedding knowledge and understanding in order to more confidently perform next time. That, that huh. kind of how do you, how do different people learn? How do we go about learning? How can we structure that? You know, what, what can we do to bias sort of... Um, 
embedding of knowledge so that it becomes behavioral action you know that's fascinating stuff yeah but whereas we just expect people to be able to learn the curriculum without learning how to learn which i think is roundly unfair it was just so fair. It's actually mindless. I mean, when you stop and think about it, the reason why that transition from GCSE to O-Levels was really, sorry, O-Levels to GCSEs was really interesting is because it did mark one of the biggest steps away from an education system that was literally designed in Victorian England mm. towards something to help people deal with the, the 20th century. Um, and here we are in the 21st century, and a lot of kids are still learning Latin instead of HTML, right? Mm. You know, Latin started off as a class differentiator, and then by 1985, it was a way of training your mind. It was the closest that it came to learning, meta-learning, in fact. Right. But they're still using Latin instead of things that would directly benefit their lives, like learning computer programming. It is mental that that is not on every curriculum as part of a, this is how you learn to learn programming. Yeah. Um, the most fascinating book I've read in the last five years is Bill Bryson's The Body. If you haven't read it, that's a recommendation. Everyone I've recommended it to thinks it's fascinating. Why wasn't biology taught like that? Why was biology never, ever, ever taught in terms of this is, it's the subtitle of the body is a user's manual. Hmm. You know, why weren't we ever taught biology in terms of this is what's going on in your body? This yeah. is the chemistry of how to build muscle or how to lose fat. Just was yeah. never taught. I've, 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 and I've said for a long time, I wish Haynes had done a, you know, how to use your brain manual. <laughs> You've just become the proud owner of, you know, <laughs> brain. The brain versus well, yeah. here's how here's how to make the most of it. Here's some features you may have that yeah. other models don't have, you know, and kind of how to run with some of that. Which is going to dominate this conversation definitely, because because in terms of how to make decisions and why people do what they do, that's that's my big concern. Before being a professional poker player, just to fill people in, after that, by grove experience, I was a, a screenwriter and director and and i learned uh, a story by robert mckee right now robert mckee if you don't know if you go and work for the bbc or any hollywood studio they will put you on robert mckee's course which is between about two thousand and four thousand dollars for a weekend right again it's like the mind gym example okay yeah. it's a very simple thing it can be taught uh it's a little bit more high level robert mckee than something like the mind gym but um there's nothing prevents a 15 and 16 year old learning it and so we did English language GCSE and O level where you're just told to go away and write stories without ever being told how to write a story, how to construct narratives, story, this great fetish in all, you know, management leadership paradigms at the moment. Just, yeah. just, we weren't taught it at all. I happen to know a lot of those tools because I was a screenwriter, but most people don't have it. And then finally, for me, uh, a good place to stop is in terms of mathematics, the maths of gambling. Now, at the very simplest level, so that people can understand gambling, so they can understand how and why they're going to lose money at a roulette table or in a casino. But then at an advanced level, what I teach, which is resource allocation under uncertainty, which has implications for the way that you learn, because it's mm -hmm. a resource that you're allocating, which has implications for change and innovation, which is dealing with uncertainty, changing yourself, changing organizations um and and leadership and running your own mind generally yeah. so that's quite a long list i'm sorry i've taken up some time at the beginning of the podcast but but it's quite hard therefore to decide within that list right of the things that i had no idea about at 18 and in various to various different extents i've learned more about in the last 30 years which of those i really want to prioritize because i just think that we are a species with the longest incubation period um, of any other species before we yeah. let out into the wild. We've decided to fill that time with a structured formal education. And yet it is just woefully doing the job that it sort of proposes to set out to achieve. Well, it's not really helping people be fit for purpose for, you know, a, a healthy and happy life. You know, it, it's kind of, yeah, it, it's doing, doing something quite different, um, valuing a certain kind of knowledge. And I, I guess my reflection there is that sort of, you know, generally speaking, you wish you had more knowledge about the range of knowledge that was available, um, rather than sort of, you know, just being able to kind of go, well, here's the curriculum, this is all you need to know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's that thing of, if, if something's exciting you, you know, you should, you should find out how little you know. Do you know, the more you learn, the more you learn there is to learn, and it should give yeah. you a thirst for knowledge and, and, and learning, which again, I know I keep coming back to this, it sounds like I'm being insecure, but I was an academic kid, right? School didn't leave me behind. Yeah. Um, uh, I went to a private school with a lot of psychological bullying, but no physical bullying. You know, I wasn't uh, unhappy. You know, I'm one of its success stories. 
And yet I didn't accept, and this is quite significant in the subject of economics, which is not coincidentally what I went on to study at Cambridge, although I changed, uh, because I had an inspirational teacher. Right. Jeff Riley, let's name check him. Um, he went on to be head of economics at Eton mm -hmm. um, at a ridiculously young age. I was, his, I was the first class he ever taught, uh, having come out of university doing his PGCE. And he gave me a love of the subject. And like, thank God, you know, for inspirational teachers, yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's the teaching that goes beyond the curriculum and gives you a passion and a thirst to, to learn this thing. And all these other subjects, I was like, you know, got my A, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, as you were going through the list as well, I was, I was just thinking around, you know, the, again, even the representation of what's important. So go back to your poker example, and you're saying, you know, that that is actually an exercise in, maths whereas all, all as, as you said to me the other day the movies would have us all believe that the best poker players are the ones who can read the other individuals and have some amazing way of knowing what's going on it strikes me that they're probably the best individuals who are able to internalize and work out statistically what's going on and be able to use their kind of you know their confidence in numbers predictions from that in terms of what course of action to take and when um, well, let me let me bounce off that and segue beautifully yeah. <laughs> into uh, what I want to sort of focus on, I think, in this conversation, because it's what I focus on generally. Uh, so so to use a sporting analogy, uh, I'm a Newcastle fan of the 1996. Um, uh, let's pretend they won this premiership. Just, <laughs> just that's, that's, word, that's, premiership. I'd, have, I'd have loved it if they did. We will. We, will. Yeah. Uh, we had two midfielders in that team called David. One was uh, David Batty and one was David yeah. Batty. Right. They're both midfielders, they're both playing in the same team, but they're completely different footballers. Okay. Uh, one is brilliant at you know winning the ball on a side three foot pass, <laughs> and one is brilliant at 60 foot or 60 yard passes and moments of genius, but otherwise sort of he's never gonna track back. Um <laughs> now the point is what that it's shows classic. is that, oh, no, do you know so far. Yeah. <laughs> what that shows is that um you can be you can be good at this thing called football and have completely different skills yeah. right? and poker is exactly the same there are poker players that are i mean certainly historically you know in the 50s and 60s those guys in texas were, may have been innumerate in some cases mm -hmm. okay those were but but they were very good at seeing into the soul of the person and telling when they were lying right which is a yeah. skill that all businesses want me to teach them and, and <laughs> can't really be taught in that way um, now, what then happened in, in really the late 90s, early 2000s is it started becoming mathematical because that's the fundamentals of poker. Mm -hmm. What poker uses is a calculation, right? It says if, uh, I don't want to complicate this, but if 50% of the time I'm going to win $100, 50% of $100 is $50. Yeah. And if 50% of the time I'm going to lose $10, 50% of that $10 is $5, which means I'm going to win $50 on average and lose $5 on average, which means on average I'm making $45, right? Yeah. That is the fundamental, when people talk about the calculated risk, that is the calculation of risk that sits at the heart of poker, right? But that probability, 50%, where do we get that from? That's the likelihood that he's got the flush or that right. he's bluffing or she. And so that's what those guys in Texas were able to do with that. Now they couldn't articulate that calculation, but like most of maths, that calculation is just a, an attempt to codify something which we do at a gut level anyway, right? Yeah. I think he's got it. Oh, I definitely think he's bluffing now, so I call, right? Yeah. I don't know he's bluffing, but I really think he is. Yeah. And I'm gonna get it right more often than not, and therefore I'm gonna make a profit. But I couldn't articulate that calculation yeah. with the guys in Texas in the 50s. So then the math starts to come to the fore, and because it is bottom line, a more useful, a more defining t aspect of the technique, the mathematicians start to win the day, okay? Yeah. But what happens then, you know, the gene pool of poker players at the lower limits by 2008, nine was several million. And so the, 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 the successful genes that bubble up to the top of that pool, the top of what I call the poker pyramid, yeah. They do both, okay? They've now, because of online poker, the fact that you can play 10 games at the same time, because every mm -hmm. game is 100 hands a minute, is 100 hands an hour instead of 30. They've now played the same number of hands by the age of 25 as the Texas guys have played by the age of 80. They've got this you know, enormous pattern recognition going on, mm -hmm. the number of hands they've seen, and the data that they're using from online collection methods allows them to assess probabilities much more successfully even than the Texas guys, right? So now they can do all the maths, 
live in their brains because they've got PhDs and stats from Stanford yeah. and their probability assessments are brilliant. And so now you have this, this Uber player. It's like, it's like, you know, Veron, he's tracking back. He can make the side passes and the moments of beauty, yeah. and 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 that's who's going to win poker now. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I guess for anyone in their chosen field of competition endeavor, it's how do you do the equivalent of that? You know, getting the confidence from the learning and and taking it with you so that you are ever more able to make the right decisions, back yourself in the right way, read this, predict even the situations that are coming, and and again, you know, that's something that isn't really taught in the mix there is you can do a load of practice, but are you aggregating it into something that's updating your model, giving you more understanding of what next, where do I want to take this? How do I want to move forward? So again, the, the kind of knowledge acquisition piece, I think is, is, is relevant there as well, because some people could practice loads and not get any better. Absolutely. So there's, there's, there's at least two points to make there. Number one is the point of market efficiency. Mm -hmm. is, is in poker, you know, you used to be able to make a pretty good living if you'd if you'd read four books, right? I mean, I, when I when I was playing, I'd read a hundred books, and that made me phenomenal, right? Um, now I'm nothing. That's really important. That's why I'm not a professional poker player. Yeah. Because the market's so efficient. The, the the level that you have to be now to make a profit in that market because of this uh, coming together of those what were skills that broadly speaking in a much smaller gene pool, some people had and some people didn't, right? So that's the first point. The second point is that being good at poker means being good at probability, right? So whereas the Texas guys would go, I don't think you've got the kings, I call, okay? Yeah. They wouldn't be able to conceptualize in 1968 what a player's doing now, which is going, I reckon there's a 22% chance that they got kings. I reckon there's a 32% chance that they got aces, you know, a 15% chance they've got ace king, yeah. Uh, and then a 35% chance of, of blank, right? And then putting that into a calculation to come up with an expectation to decide whether to call or not. I mean, that's not just beyond the ken of the guys in 1968. It's like it wouldn't have occurred to them that that's what they should be doing, okay? Yeah. And, and my point that I want to get to is that that's what education doesn't allow you to do either, is to live in the ambiguity, because of what we were sort of talking about in that little brief intro, you and I, which yeah. is that in education, it, there's a right or wrong answer. And yeah. what Oak is training you is the idea that there isn't a right or wrong answer, okay? And then you come to this third point, which is what you said, uh, the last thing you just said there before I started speaking, which is this idea of iteration. Yeah. And, yeah. and that absolutely is the thing that I think, if there's one thing that I wish that I'd known when I was 18 that I don't know now, it's that that ambiguity, it's a really good place to be. Mm to exist. It's where I've been for the last two or three months with the pandemic is I haven't been trying to, you know, do two or three speeches a week and hit it out the park and, and be on point. And yes. I don't sleep when it's like that because I've got to get every plane and I can't be relaxed and there's no margin for error. You know, my clients pay me the money that the speech is perfect. And yeah. um, I know it sounds a bit pretentious, but I sort of envisage myself as being a bit like a hundred meter runner is that I've got to live the rest of my week that those three hours are perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I find that very stressful. And this idea, I mean, at 18, you know, I got the Angela fever. I was that classic kind of, you know, stressed about exams kid um, because I wanted everything to be perfect. Mm. And I think the last 30 years of my life have been a growing realization that it doesn't have to be, it probably never will be. Yeah. And that there is something intensely good and productive about it not being. Yeah. And, I, and, I'll give, and I'll give you a specific example about that from one of sort of two or three realms of my life. And that is, and that is directing, right? Yeah. When, I, when I started directing, so I go to Cambridge, I don't really want to do economics at all, <laughs> which they sort of know <laughs> quite quickly. So I want to direct plays, do the right. so I'm very lucky, I have a phenomenally talented year. Olivia Coleman uh, is one of my good friends, David Mitchell, Rob Webb, technically yeah. I put them together, uh, great people. And one of my early productions was the Footlights Pantomime, right? And uh, the Footlights Pantomime is like the biggest, most expensive show of the year. I'm doing the first term of my second year. And, um, and it's like directing an action movie because it's really about, you know, when the explosion goes off and how we get Cinderella's carriage to appear on the stage yeah. and this kind of thing. And so you're directing, right? You're putting people and you're going, that's good. Say it like this, leave a pause there because that's funnier. And 
and I was quite good. I was quite good at that that kind of directing, and and I enjoyed that kind of directing. But my development as a director was to get to a place where you didn't you didn't tell people how to say lines. Okay, right. is yeah. you you just allowed them to to do it, and then you nudged it, and you did what you referred to, which is call it iteration, call it feedback, call it yeah. honing. Yeah. You you didn't get het up that the first thing didn't work. You relaxed and tried it a completely different way. Yeah. You played with it. And so rather than the thing the, the success of the scene standing or falling by your ability to tell people how this scene is going to work, you allowed people to find it in the in that ambiguity. And it has so many different benefits. Like number one, they take as a you know as a management method. It's not unique to theatre, obviously. They take ownership of it because they've found it. Yeah, you yeah. Told them yeah. How to do well, the intrinsic motivation goes up, so there's more commitment to it because yeah, they're self discovered. Yeah. Number two is like the sum of the parts. The, the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts, and much greater than you. You mm -hmm. know, saying this is how this scene runs and is funny. Um, and. Uh, Number three, you achieve something by the end of it that has been through, there's a concept called the, the J curve, which is actually a political concept, which societies need to go through a sort of fra fracturing and breakdown before they come together more whole, right? Mm -hmm. but it can be applied to anything. It's just dead simple. Things get worse before they get better. Decorate your house, right? Yeah. Things get worse before they get better. Yeah. Um, and if you are prepared to enjoy that period, you know, you talked about, conscious improvement through feedback and I'm sure yeah. at some point during the series you'll talk to Matthew Saeed writer of the great book Bounce you know which is about directed practice and there's a brilliant statistic in that that I often quote which is the the ice dancers statistic so some ice dancers in the United States win many more gold medals than other dancers and there's a researcher called Jeff Colvin who wants to try and find out why that is and to correlate it against something else in their lives in the data I think he starts by thinking it might have something to do with that parental professional class or, you know, upbringing, no correlation. Um, maybe their own academic ability, no correlation. Uh, hours spent on the rink, yes, because practice makes perfect. But the single strongest correlation he can find is between gold medals one and the number of times they fall over during practice. Because they're, they're, because they're trying to do something that they can't do at the moment. Yeah. Now, I hate this word failure in many ways for reasons we may come to, but because it's such an emotive word and because the idea of failing turns people off. Um, but essentially that's what you do when you fall over during practice or as Claire Baldy yeah. talked about falling off the horse. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there is a reason which mathematically we can prove why this is, but, but forget the maths for a moment. It's, it's about being comfortable with iteration and imperfection and knowing that you'll get to somewhere more satisfying and beautiful and successful in the end. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and, and those, those examples both speak to the fact that if you haven't got a frame of reference as what is correct in the first place, you are far more likely to find what version of correct you would, you know, is, is gratifying and feels like it was a worthwhile journey to go on. Absolutely. But education wise, we're constantly given, right, that'll get you 100%. And we'll just take marks off if you are not successful again. So, so that's the the you know the unhelpful failure reference of you know and you directing. Well, I haven't got my picture of perfect that I'm giving you. Um, let's just find out what version of this scene we are going to create and and yeah. how that gets delivered. And, yeah. let, and let's not have a fixed point to feel we've failed against. Yeah. You know, that's freeing. That's that's that freedom in learning. Absolutely. Being being prepared, you know, in, in that ice dance scenario, being as actors in their rehearsal room, just just falling over a lot in practice. I used to. So one of my realizations of this, so I'm 18 on the 11th, of, uh, 17th of June, 1991, and I take a year out and I go to Cambridge. <coughs> and in, in those first two years, the way that I used to describe it was, you know, like night vision. You know, if you look directly at something, whatever it is about the rods and cones in your eyes, if you look directly at something in the night, you can't see it. You, it it's 15 degrees off that you can see. And that was the way that I sort of described directing is if you if you try and achieve this, you won't actually achieve it anyway. You'll achieve something that's maybe a bit like it. And maybe it's better. Yeah. But, maybe yeah. but but as and so as frustrating as it can be, I hope I can say this. I got a reputation early on in Cambridge for being a good director. Okay. Right. And I, the reputation, it was ill founded, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I knew who were the best directors of my generation at, at, at Cambridge, and it wasn't me. Um, a couple of them are quite famous now. 
and they were doing what I'm describing now. They were allowing their cast to find it. But the casts all thought I was good because I went into the room with a clear idea and gave them clear direction, right? And people like clear direction. Because again, particularly at a place like Cambridge, which I've said way too much in this conversation, but particularly where, where everyone strives for, they've all got a lot of right answers in their lives. They've all got a lot of A's, yeah, right? yeah, they've all got yeah. gold stars. They like knowing right answers. Yeah. You know, they, they like someone going in with that kind of clarity and going boom, 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 whoops, there you go my trousers, that's how the laugh gets. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, yeah, no, I, I, I think that, that, that there is, again, that educational reference. So, so I tell Americans, I went to school in Cambridge, it was just sixth form college, and, <laughs> and, and, and I reduced the A-level grade myself, because it, it was part of a, you know, it was an Oxbury sixth form college, and I, I, I just brought the average grade down by my failure to sort of do anything. <laughs> in any particular way there um but but it, it, you know it is that that kind of reference point of people want to know what right looks like because they've been taught to kind of work that you know they feel comfortable in that space rather than actually you're going to have to define this for yourself and use a completely different frame of thinking yeah. which is about determining the answer and being able to say why you think it's the answer yeah. rather than telling showing someone else that you know the answer that they want you to give and that, that and from a confidence point of view they are totally different One's confident to be yourself. The other one's confident to be right in the eyes of someone else. Yeah. You know, motivationally, that just changes the game. So, um, as I'm sure many of your viewers know, you know, one of the great writers about this when it comes to education is, is Carol Dweck, who talks about the growth yeah. mindset, which sits you know, absolutely directly on this spine, is, is this idea that it's not about the quest for the right answer, it's about the quest for the right method, mm -hmm. method that can cope with it. And it has parallels in Darwin, of course, which is it's not the strongest or the fittest that survive, it's those most, most able to to adapt and learn. And that's that can be true of a static system, let alone a, a dynamic system. Yeah, yeah. But I wanted to ask you, therefore, because as a speaker, I'm, I'm a lone wolf, really. Yeah, I don't yeah. get, you know, I, I only really get the opportunity to practice this on myself. Mm -hmm. I would say that the majority of companies that I go into and start talking like this are quite daunted by the idea at first. But I, I am genuinely interested in your experience of working with elite athletes. Would they have fallen into those two camps as well? Would there have been a majority in one or the other? How would they have responded in the main to being told to find their own way rather than getting right answers from you? So oh, that's the wrong way of putting it. But you're, you're yeah, 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 So de definitely from the coaches, the, you know, the coaches are the people who are providing the training program, the technical model. They're giving feedback, you know, and there, and there's there, there's there's definitely. I, I've talked a lot over the years to say there are a couple of kinds of athletes. There's ones who exploit the training program, and there's others who do the training program. Okay. The ones who exploit the training program are able to kind of go, where am I? What kind of athlete do I think I'm? going to be what's this the stimulus of this training program and how am I going to use that to help me grow how I want to grow and there's the other athletes who kind of go this is a successful system um, I'm going to do everything the coaches tell me um, and, and and they're brilliant and and you know physiologically everything they will do what's required but when it comes to racing the person who has exploited the training program who has developed that independent desire to kind of you know, take the steps themselves. I think they're just they're, they're more more robustly prepared for that incredible moment of scrutiny when you're asking, "Will I be good enough?" Mm. So you're asking, you know, the the ones who have exploited it are kind of going, "I want to find out whether I'm going to be good enough." The ones who have done the training program really pretend they have to work harder to fight against that. I mustn't fail. I've done the training. I mustn't let the coach down. I've done the training. I mustn't be one of the people who it didn't work for. And so you, you do get quite a difference in the, the foundation of confidence. Yeah. And that, that's the big thing that I see the difference. The really great performers are the ones who it's tough for them to lose confidence. Yeah. The ones who are good, but maybe don't quite have that sense of kind of, you know, ambition and drive. Um, Confidence is present, but it can be lost and, and undermined much more quickly. Yeah. So, and and I and that's the bit where I think it's that self determined foundation is one that allows you to accept responsibility for what's going to happen. And, yeah. and that and that's freeing. It's still not easy. It's still not easy. No, 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 no. Exactly I, the odds in your favour. 
I, it, it's harder, I think. So yeah. there's lots of different examples of this in poker, but I'll give you one which I think ju just you can reflect back so easily into different areas of society, which, which, by the way, don't necessarily have to do with learning. And this is this is one of the things that I get very sort of animated about because um, I'm a speaker who has has ended up being a speaker talking about has ended up being a speaker who might be classed as a motivational speaker. Okay, right. because there's massive overlap between what I talk about and kind of motivational. Yeah, uh, motivational speakers, subject matter. Right, I'll give you the situation in poker. Let's imagine you've got four aces, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the river cards out, so there's no more cards to come. And your opponent clearly has quite a good hand, okay? <clears throat> um, and you've got four aces. You can be beaten by a straight flush. But let's say there's no straight flush on the board. All right, so, yeah. so you're going to win this hand, okay? So what you're trying to do now is you're trying to make a bet that, and here's the key, maximizes your long-term expectation, okay? Yeah. So what I mean by that is, let's say you bet 10,000 mm -hmm. and there's a 50% chance that he calls 10,000, okay? That means sometimes you're going to win it, sometimes you're going to lose it, but in the long run, the way that we calculate that is 50% of 10,000, if, if that's right, okay, yeah. is 5,000. That's your expectation with that bet. But 50% of the time, your opponent's going to fold. Yeah. Okay? yeah. Well, now let's say you bet 2,000 and there's a 90% chance that they'll call 2,000. Mm -hmm. okay? So 90% of 2,000 is 1,800, right? Now, there's only a 10% chance now that your opponent's going to fold. Yeah. But the long-term expectation, the value of that bet is much, 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 much less, okay? Yeah. And therefore, and again, I know that we've plucked those numbers out of the blue, and it comes to something which an economist would call the price elasticity of the call. But you are better off as a poker player. It's a much more profitable play to make the £5,000 bet, even though there's a 50% chance that your opponent will fall. And it will look to the outsider like, oh, well, you, you bet too big, you got greedy, okay? Yeah. That has massive implications for all of this that we're talking about, okay? Because what, what if you apply that to Jeff Colvin skaters, in trying to do the thing that they can't do at the moment, they're making 5,000 pound bets, but they're falling over more often. Yeah. But the value of each of those actions, that's why this, concept of learning is about return on investment yeah. under uncertainty the value of each of those actions is worth more in that sense the roi is the learning yeah. is the expanding their body's capability yeah. let me give you another example and before i give this example because i really really don't want to go out to the world defending this tory government i'm just going to say i'm a lefty all right and so what i'm about to say now pains me but it's actually really important when uh, Hancock may or may not have hit his 100,000 tests per day target, there's a huge outcry on Twitter and, you know, in the Mirror and the Guardian about, oh, they're fiddling it. And Double let's say they didn't, right? Let's say they didn't. Let's say they made 70,000. What is better? Matt Hancock promising to do 20,000 a day and hitting it, exceeding it, making 22,000 or trying to achieve 100,000 and failing and making 70,000. Yeah, that's a really important point, I think, for the world in which we live and for the way in which, you know, particularly our public services are run yeah. because we get we get the public services that the Daily Mail deserves. Mm -hmm. They weren't guilty on this occasion, I don't think, because it's a Tory government. But it, do a session with anyone from the public sector. And it's the fear of what the Daily Mail will say if they try to do something and fail that stops them from doing it. Mm. Um, but it's also true for private companies and organisations and sports people is, are you prepared to do something which in this case is a bigger bet, in that case might be setting yourself a bigger target, might mean a bigger investment, could be of energy, could be a greater risk of injury, could mm -hmm. be status, standing, reputation, respect, credibility, self-respect, self-esteem. These are all scarce resources that we have and that we could lose. Are you prepared to take that route. Am I, as a director in a rehearsal room, prepared to do a whole series of things which don't quite work, but where in the long run, once the expectation is realized by the long run of the J-curve, yields the additional value, rather than going bish bash bosh, everyone feels comfortable, but the end yeah. result isn't as good. Yeah. And that's where I think education fails. Yeah, it's and again, you know, so I, I just relay that straight again from the education piece. There's, there's, there's the bar and you're either above it or you're not. You know, rather than, you know, all the stuff we end up talking to people about in the business world is, is around, you know, what goals you can set them, you know, <laughs> and you can set them in a number of ways. They don't just have to be a hit or miss thing, you know, 
you can set one target, which is if everything goes amazingly, what might this look like? Or we can have another one that then sits underneath it. And you say, right, well, if we do what we know we're capable of, that's going to make us proud and sort of satisfied, what will that look like? And then we can set another one, which is given what we are, what is the bare minimum we'd, ex we'd expect and accept of ourselves in this situation? Yeah. I don't know why we, we, you know, we carry on with these, you know, black and white success and failure when, when there's such a nuance. We can create the nuance in advance and then bounce off those different reference points, depending upon what our first data point tells us. Well, actually, we're still on for the moonshot. Brilliant. We'll keep going for that. Actually, it looks like, you know, minimal acceptable. Let's let's still keep working away from that and push away from that. See if we can get some progress. But it gives us different ways of using our motivational energy rather than, again, what we're taught from school is, you know, good people get high scores. Not so good people don't, you know, and, you know, um, if, if you're not tracking for a good one, expect to be roundly demotivated and not particularly much used to people. Um, so, you know, we need to build more in. Work tries to move people away from that. <clears throat> I'm sure your work tries to move people away from that. For, for my final thought here is, you know, the question is, what would you do differently if you knew then what you know yeah, now? Yeah. In some cases, I would do exactly the same, okay? Because in some cases, I specifically did certain things for about two and a half years. I was an actor, I was a writer, I was a director, I was a professional poker player, I ran a company. I then found speaking and training and found my bliss, okay? Mm -hmm. And since then, I've been very focused and honed and I've two and a half thousand sessions and I think I'm all right at it. But how did I find that? It was by being prepared to both start and the whole conversation that we haven't had. Stop doing yeah. those things, right? To redirect my resources because yeah. anything new to start something old has to stop. Not all quitting is bad. It's actually liberation, liberating. Yeah. But, but what I would say, I don't know the average age of the, of the people who, who watch this, but I know I was talking the other day to a, a group at university, sort of 24, 25 postgrads. And of course, you know, Corona has been a huge blow to their lives, like all of their life. But I mean, my life, my life plans have been upset, but their life plans have been completely turned over. You know, well, what are they going to do for the next two or three years in that kind of job market? Yeah. And, and my point to them was, and a book which we mentioned in the preamble to each other, or a recommendation, is a book called Range. Um, which specifically makes this argument for, uh, in that context, in that context, the context of your career, but we've been talking about it in lots of different contexts during this conversation, being happy in that ambiguity, being happy with the imperfection. Best piece of advice that I had in that period of my life, I think that gave me the life that I had was from my agent, bless him, who went on to lose me as a, as a screenwriter as a result. <laughs> but he said, doesn't matter what you're doing before you're 30, as long as you're doing something. Right. And that is a brilliant piece of advice. Yeah. Do things that you're passionate about, that you want to do. I know you've got to pay the rent. I know that's really important. But what school instills in us is this need for focus and results. And it's got to be now. And that is not necessarily the way to true success. Yes. But I've got a great friend who, for much of his life, was a, as a brickie. It's called Dave Johns. You, you'll, you'll know who he is. He's the guy, he's the star of I, Daniel Blake, the Ken Loach film that won the Palm Door. Right. Um, and when he was a brick, he was really funny. And we always used to say to him, mate, you're so funny, you should be a comedian. And eventually, like in his late 30s, he became a comedian. Then he started running comedy clubs. And for the most of the last 25 years, he's been a comedian. And then late in his life, he's been an actor occasionally, mm -hmm. a day on Spender together. And then, you know, Ken Loach casts him in this film and he, they win the Palm Door and his whole life is different. That did not come from doing the sensible thing first off. His life meandered a bit, but he got to a better place as a result. Yeah, yeah, no, really clear. And, you know, there's a lot of the messages coming out from these conversations about ultimately people having the confidence to be themselves and kind of, you know, make the most of what they have sort of you know, um, now determined is their talent and their bliss and their calling and their passion. And, and it, you know, I guess for me, it's how do we help people get on the pathway to finding that in a meaningful way and, and early, not, not, you know, not necessarily speeding things up, but helping people be confident to be themselves because we, you know, we, we give lots of people lots of training about how not to be confident to be themselves, but, you know, yeah. to, to wish they were someone else or yeah. more like other people. Yeah. So it's br brilliant reflections, Casper, and we, we could carry on, I'm sure for a lot longer. However, I know you've got lunch to get to and, uh, and other things to do as well. So, um, amazing stuff thank you very very much it's thank a podcast relay and you're handing over um so i'd love to know who you're going to hand over to and why and uh, and then we can get ready for leg six next week
Yeah, so I want to hand over to a guy called Dan Pembridge, um, who I, I know lots of people better than I know Dan, but he's um, a fascinating guy. I won't try and summarise his life, but he's someone who has embraced risk in a different and much more scary and admirable context than me at the poker table um, in, uh, in literally life-threatening situations. And um, yeah, he's going to talk about a similar thing, but from a different perspective, move the conversation on and hand the baton to someone else afterwards. Brilliant. So thank you very much. I, I, will, I will go and do some research on Dan. I'll look forward to finding out about him and getting ready for next week. Another take on risk then. So I'll be very much looking forward to that. Um, Casper, brilliant. Thank you very much. This is on YouTube Live. It's going to be there for people. It will be on our website, the performance room as well within the next... Uh, half an hour or so the, the people in the background will get working on that and that will be available um it's it's great just to, you know I'm, I'm delighted where the podcast relay is taking me with these different conversations and uh we'll chat again very soon but thank you for your time this afternoon sir thank you for everyone who's tuned in and thank you for everyone who watches again um on many of the sources that we've got afterwards and uh thanks for the comments in there but enjoy your afternoon everyone take care and uh, see you next week thank you casper cheers